Mad Men is a show about history, but history is often heard only faintly, as if through the walls. Rather than having its characters pop up, Forrest Gump-like, shaking hands with the president, <laughs> its characters experience the biggest events as most of us do, on their TV sets, and in subtle echoes through everyday life. Season 6 reflected a violent year in Vietnam in a similar manner. It starts with Don meeting a soldier at a bar, enjoying r and Lee. What do you say we get into some trouble? Oblivious to what's ahead of him. It's PFC Dinkins, by the way. The Tet Offensive is just a month away. After a series of other illusions, a lighter bearing a real inscription with a violent history, and a politically charged late-night gag that ruins a commercial. Because they cut off the Viet Cong's ears and wore them on a string around their neck like a trophy. <sighs> the season premiere ends on a similar note of obliviousness. This real New York Times headline seems blissfully unaware that things are about to get much worse. Be true to what you said on paper. Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy will be assassinated, and 1968 will be the deadliest year of the war for U.S. troops. But for here on out on the show, Vietnam will return mostly as a specter. My wife thinks I'm MIA, but I'm actually dead. Midway through the season, Don has another encounter at a bar. After losing Jaguar, Sterling Cooper Draper Price decides to team up with their rivals, Cutler Gleason and Shaw, to take on the Chevrolet account. This is General Motors. They fight the war with bodies on the ground. Listen to how Don proposes the deal. Hey, Lieutenant. Want to get into some trouble? And recall where he heard that phrase. Listen, Lieutenant. Hey, Lieutenant. What do you say we get into some, some trouble? The Chevy account will become their Vietnam. Much of this plays out in episode What's eight. It? An amphetamine-fueled trip down the rabbit hole which puzzled many recappers. The episode finds the team in over their heads, with a company for whom their work is never good enough and which makes demands that they can never meet. Three years of monthly deadlines, that's the rest of 68, 69, and 70. Best they wonder whether they need more men, but in spite of a casualty... Frank Gleason was a great artist and a great friend. Or two... Where's Ed? So his heart stopped and Roger took him to the hospital. They decide to put death out of their minds. Now they get used to it or stop thinking about it. And to press on with blind optimism, they give strangely martial rallying I know you're speeches. you're all feeling the darkness here today, but there's no reason to give in. No matter what you've heard, this process will not take years. In my heart, I know we cannot be defeated. To boost morale, Jim Cutler calls in a doctor to administer amphetamines, a tactic used by the U.S. Armed Forces in Vietnam. As Cutler puts it, No, oh, he's going to fix you up. It's an order. And Frank Leeson's hippie daughter, who fancies herself a girl of the East, shows up to administer to a different kind of needs. You want to get it on? Just like the prostitutes who sprung up around soldiers in Vietnam. But every time we get a car, this place turns into a whorehouse. The young people are hit hardest. Stan is trying to forget the death of his cousin, who was killed in Vietnam. This trauma may explain why he's taken to wearing green pocketed shirts that resemble those from Vietnam uniforms. At one point in his deranged sadness, he even dons a bandana and plays a deadly game, and brings to mind another image of Vietnam trauma, one of the most iconic. Ed says that Stan is... going to look just like St. Sebastian. Which, as a writer for Vulture pointed out, evokes a famous Esquire cover featuring Muhammad Ali posed like St. Sebastian, murdered by arrows. That iconic cover appeared in April 1968, just weeks before the events of this episode, for a story about Ali's arrest for evading the draft. Doesn't hurt at all. When Stan finally confesses his grief over Vietnam to Peggy, Peggy responds with some sage advice. You have to let yourself feel it. You can't dampen it with drugs and sex. Stan doesn't follow Peggy's advice, and no one else does either. But no one has it worse than Ken Cosgrove, who's in charge of the Chevy account. At the beginning of this episode, his bosses force him to race into danger with a gun to his head, though all he wants to do is go home. When the Chevy campaign leaves him injured, he returns home hobbling around on a cane. He's left like a Vietnam veteran. No one understands his injuries. No one cares that I almost got killed? Or his trauma. It's my job to go hunting so they can fire off their guns and inch from my ear and laugh when I get startled because it's my job. When they ignore his complaints and send him back into the field, he of course only gets injured again. Wait! Though this injury does at least turn into a ticket home. For obvious reasons, Ken is withdrawing from handling Chevy. Of course, the war will go on without Ken. As the season approaches its end, Pete prepares to come in doing? with reinforcements. Getting ready to do a little hunting. Though he won't be able to Pete, go it alone. You're going to need to know where the landmines are buried. Well, you know what they say about Detroit. 
It's all fun and games till they shoot you in the face. There are a handful of other Vietnam-esque What's moments in the season. Oh my god, oh my god! Jesus! But in the end, they're heavily focused on Chevy. So why Chevy? Perhaps because its parent company was part of the war effort. Well, aren't you having dinner with General Motors, one of the largest defense contractors in the world? The use of the Chevy account to echo the war is not just clever symbolism. It's sly political commentary.